We can't even see anything, do we? Okay, let's go a little way down, okay? Let's go, let's go a little way. We just want a clearing where we can see the ledges. Now, this is so overgrown. Okay, so we've like trekked through the bush. Um, trying to find uh, a particular murder scene at the weir. And this in the 70s, when I was a child, was an extremely popular swimming hole. And uh, there was a big damn wall, and we called, called this the weir. We used to be able to just walk down a dirt track all the way down there. And on that side of the weir, um, one night, it was a moonlit night, uh, it's where they uh, murdered the 12 year old that I saw abducted from, it's either Heathcote Road here or something that looked a lot like it. And they, um, I was in the back of a car and they abducted uh, a 12 year old girl who was walking by the road. She was wearing red and white, you know, sh um, t-shirt and, and shorts. She had long brown hair. I just remember she had long brown hair and pretty girl. And when we stopped over to talk to her, she knew them. And they I was in the back right hand passenger of, uh, side of the car and she jumped in the back left and um, they handed her some candy I think it was laced and this poor girl uh, there was about oh, I can't remember there's a group of men circled around her in, in robes but a lot of them were priests from uh, Ingerdeen Boys Town and um, various people and what they did was um, they hang this girl to death on the ledge and then they sodomized her and as they sodomized her dead body um, the, the remaining men stood, stood around masturbating and I saw all of this and then they th they made me think they're throwing her body in the weir um, and then I, I can remember being frightened of swimming. My father used to make me swim across the weir and um, there used to be like a little, I don't know, some sort of motor pump house or something on this side and I just have this image of going, oh, I just don't want to touch any dead bodies like while I'm swimming because I, I didn't like murky waters and to this day I don't like swimming in waters where I can't see what's underneath because of this experience and I remember swimming across because this happened when I was uh, six and I remember swimming after that, not long after that, and thinking, oh, please don't let me touch any dead bodies with my toes. I just don't want to touch any dead bodies. And I remember being terrified when we used to come as a family and swim here. We swim here all the time. So they, you know, they sodomised her. Um, and then the next uh, thing I remember, seeing her body, her body was transported to Holsworthy Army Barracks. And it, um, we went through a side gate um, on, off Heathcote Road and we were met by um, Chan. He seemed a lot more powerful than just someone who was in the reserves. Uh, my experience of him was and, and that girl was... Well, I'll talk about that when we get to Holsworthy's. I just remembered as we're climbing up the hill, I forgot to tell you about Stephen who... Um, he raped me also on that ledge. So while those men were busy with the... And Peter Holozak was there. He was one of the ones raping her. But while they were doing all that, this guy who fancied me pulled me aside, a pedo, and uh, raped me violently. And I, I had to relive all that in the police statement and I really had to detail it for the first time in my life. And that was an unsanctioned rape. I wasn't to just be touched by anybody. And he paid for it with his life later on, when I was about 14. He was um, burnt at the stake. No, he was bashed to death at the dog breeder's house. He was tied, tied to a stake, bashed to death, and. So all in all, rather nasty experience. She has a voice. Um, she is articulate. You wouldn't know it to speak to her, but in her writing and, um, you know, she gives other people a voice and she does it well. I'm not stopping for some stupid reason. I mean, I, I can't stop. I'm compelled to keep going. This is not just about me. This is about a whole bunch of victims that are not here to give voice themselves to what they experience. This is not just me. I represent a whole thousands of people behind me, babies and adults and children and whatever, right? And I'm very conscious of that. 
and to see the pain and anguish he's in is not it's not something you put on so that the, those reactions are real this is Holsworthy army barracks it's one of the side entrances uh, on Heathcote Road this is the sort of entrance that I was um, taken into the army grounds via um, it's through the side entrance that I was picked up by, I was collected by like those jeeps you see in MASH, on the TV show MASH, um, those army sort of jeeps with the big backs on them, with the, the canvas flaps. I was met by an Asian, well, recruit named Chan, and apparently he's the only Asian at the time that was in at Holsworthy, and he was supposed to be in the reserves. He was a vicious serial killer. The, the girl that was murdered at the weir was um, brought Quick, was brought here and Chan collected her body. She, in the end, um, ended up in the military freezer and I was uh, abused by Chan and other officers in sort of makeshift camps on the army grounds. It was distressing to say the least. And we better get out of here because someone's just pulled up. Let's go, Shane. Children haven't seen daylight. They're trapped, they, they held her down on the uh, fifth level under Holsworthy. And you said that they said to you they're waiting for the light man. Yeah, they told me that they used to um, get visited by the light man. What does that mean? Um, they described him and, uh, and I turned around and I said, oh yeah, I know him. You know, that's, that's Jesus Christ. They didn't know him or his name. They just... Mm -mm. No. Those kids are the worst memory of all. I've seen some bad shit by those kids in the cage. And I was made to bond with them and I uh, spent a few days in a, in, a, in a cage with them in the dark. And you know, they'd be sitting there like a captivated kindergarten audience, you know, and I'd be teaching them about, you know, what's up, so up there. And I was only little, what was I, six? Like what I was telling you at East Mwoolumba, where they were sticking sticks up handicapped girls' vaginas while the teachers masturbated, and they've done nothing about it. You tell me where the reality lies in all that. Those military police might be going through our car. You got it. Come on, Ray Martin. Welcome to my parish. This is the head church in the Sutherland Shire Diocese for satanic ritual. This is a marble altar, a step up from St. John Bosco. Um, marble floor. Very easy cleanup of blood spillage. Uh, I attended multiple, multiple rituals here. Satanic ritual abuse. Uh, I've seen multiple people murdered on this marble slab. Um, so we're at Regina Coli Catholic Church in Beverly Hills in the Sutherland Shire, a suburb south of Sydney. Um, you'll note the eagle, which is a predominant symbol features, it's also representative of the phoenix, um, the whole order out of chaos theme, etc. Dating back to Horus and from uh, ancient Egypt. I, I well remember that window. That, uh, I think there's a crypt beneath this one, um, but I, I don't know how you get there. So this was the one that was brought, uh, attended by um, Dr. Mark, Aka Leonis Petruscus, and um, various people around the Sutherland Shire, uh, various police officers, lots of priests, uh, the priests who worked here at the time. 
This church was actually founded by a relative of Father Paul Evans, who was convicted of pedophilia at Boys Town. Um, there's strong ties between this church and the American military, uh, which is indicated by various emblems uh, on the front of the church, on the windows. So this is where we came for the real big sort of, what do you call it, sort of, I don't know, regional, regional ceremonies. I was made queen bee of this diocese in, when I was about 14. Not something to aspire to. I mean, yeah. How freaking obvious can it get? Look at the eagle. What's that got to do with the Bible and the biblical Jesus Christ and biblical Christianity? What has this got to do with Christianity? Nothing. It's got everything to do with Satanism. That's all I'm saying. She was just different. They didn't know how to handle her. Mm. She, she, there was no one like her in our year at school. Mm. Have you met anyone like her since? Uh, no. <laughs> I have to say no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really normal for gifted kids to have that. It's, you know, it's not all fabulous. Mm. And that's something it's hard to convey to people. So. You know, you have that isolation, that, that natural isolation starts at around primary school where, you, where, you're, where suddenly your interaction with other people has, you know, this meaning in this secluded environment and there's all of a sudden there's a sort of social construct that you're, and you're finding your place in that. She was so sharp, really, really sharp. Very intelligent girl. Now, the effect that has for a lot of people when they meet her is that, um, actually there's probably two, two aspects. One is this mirror effect. When people get to know her, they can't play their games with her. And that's, so for, for, for people who like to play games, for people who've got things to, I don't like to say, things to hide, but they're trying to present themselves as one way when they're not really that way. Um, yeah they will get, they will find themselves very uncomfortable with Fiona. Mm. And Fiona will pick that up and she doesn't like it. Mm. And she won't, she won't say I don't like you to the person, but she, won't, she doesn't like people who do play games, and people who are pretending to be something they're not. And her reaction to that is it's not anger or whatever, but she'll provoke them. Mm. She'll say something, she'll put them in a, talk to them about something, put them in a situation where they have to look at that. You know, what game you're playing. If, you, if you're gonna play this game, then you're gonna get, they end up feeling very awkward. This is Kurnell. Um, we're at the Caltex oil refinery. Um, I was brought here when I was nine with a group of about 10 children. We were placed um, in front of one of the factory furnace ovens and one by one they threw the children in the ovens. They made me think that I was going to be next and I tried to stop them from burning uh, a good friend of mine that I'd grown up with. These are kids that were just bred for, bred in secret for use for this purpose and for sex slavery. Yeah, I was roughed up for trying to stop them and, and I was made to think I was next, but I wasn't, it was just to traumatise me. The encircled pentagram sign on the Caltech symbol is, is, is no accident. There's only one way you get become that rich and powerful. That's by compromising. To gain that power, they will sacrifice people. They'll all su seek a supernatural power in some way, whatever way they can get that power. But that's, that's the very basic bottom line. It doesn't matter what you want to call it. I mean, I can, I can, I could take a victim so far, but I, how are you going to deal with the spiritual side of all of this? You know. So you see it as an essential ingredient, the spiritual side. Ah, it's, yeah, it's the main ingredient. If you're baking a cake, it's the flour. That's something you encounter daily, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of. And you know, they don't, they don't fully consciously acknowledge that it's there. But once you start seeing it, it doesn't stop. I understand 
coven. I mean, the old traditional one that everyone understood was a witch's coven, which um, is a lot more prevalent than what people would like to believe, I think, exists. But then you have, I think, as I understand it now, I might be wrong, but I think it's... Um, I consider an occult group to be a coven. Occult as it can come under many, many names, but there's always uh, like a, a mystery religion aspect to it. Now, I think I have come to face to face with many types, whether you want to call them Scottish Rite ones, um, bikey ones, Hare Krishna ones, you know, there, there's so many. Um, and I just see a coven as um, a group of people, any description. And they have a, a hidden aspect to them. All right, well, we're at Kurnell. It's a peninsula. Um, there's heaps of little beaches and coves and things around here. Um, we're losing light, so we can't find the beach, but uh, I remember distinctly a beach that was um, I was taken to as a kid by Dr. Mark, Aka Leonis Petruscus. Um, and when I was taken there, I was, um, I was told to dig up a body. And uh, I dug up a, a body of a little boy who must have been about five and had blonde hair. It was in this area. Uh, there's a very prominent, uh, <laughs> pedophile politician was there and he wanted um, Leonis to uh, cover for the, the death. This is a politician who's into necrophilia and uh, he's often been portrayed as the undertaker by um, newspaper cartoonists because I think people know what he's into. I think it's one of the major magazines said that he used to like to go over to Thailand to have sex with little boys. Well this fellow likes to have sex with dead little boys. And I know because I saw it to traumatise me because that's the whole point of trauma-based mind control is to re-traumatise the victim to keep their um, trauma-based programming intact. So I experienced lots of traumas and this was one of them. And I overheard a discussion between this politician and Dr Mark Petruscus um, about how they're going to fabricate the death of the child, uh, which was probably, uh, I don't know how he died, you know asphyxiation or something but um there was talk of a blue ring doctor puss sting and I, so I don't I don't know what was worked out or whether that was what they uh, used as a to cover or I'm not sure but we've I know that the researchers behind this doco since found out that Petruscus wrote a uh, published an article um, to do with um, the a death in Papua New Guinea of a five-year-old well the stinging of a five-year-old girl um, who uh, got poisoned by a, a conefish. So it was certainly an area that uh, Petruscus was familiar with and having studied tropical medicine at Sydney Uni, uh, he was familiar with poisons and all that sort of thing. That's one thing I experienced down here. Another thing I experienced down here um, when I was a young child was um, uh, a nurse that worked with uh, Leonis um, in the daytime she uh, was used as a honey trap for a surfer. She seduced him and promised him sex. And then he was, I think he was drugged and, and the guy had like curly blondish hair. And I saw him uh, ritually sacrificed to, to Moloch. It was a fire ceremony that night. And that's what they like to do. They like to burn people alive. And they did it somewhere around here. I mean, it's so, uh, it was very secluded back then. Uh, Sydney wasn't so populated, you know, 30 years ago, uh, 30 plus years ago. So this was a, a, a popular site for 
the coven members to murder people and dispose of bodies without being detected. And they just get the local cops who are involved with them or local doctors like Petruscus to, to cover. Anyway, and I, I wrote to the New South Wales coroner and I said, look, I've, my researchers have just found out the true identity of Dr. Mark, he's actually Petruscus. And I said, every birth certificate, death certificate that that man ever signed now needs to be investigated because everything that man did should be treated as suspicious. And they responded, oh, we can't do anything without um, being directed by the New South Wales Police. So I forwarded their response, their written response to the New South Wales Police Commission. I said, could you please direct these, the coroner to investigate these, you know, these documents that Petruscus has fabricated to my knowledge. And I, I made a big list of all the murders that I remember that he, he wrote death certificates for or was involved with in some way. That's the reality, folks. I've had to fight very hard to have my, the crimes I witnessed and, and was subjected to investigated. Well, they happened, and they happened here. <laughs> Australia, where the bloody hell are you? Buried. Um, I have often described her as crazy. <laughs> this this week, you know, talking to different friends, I've, I've said I've got my crazy friend coming down to stay with me this weekend. <laughs> but she's crazy in a good way. Fun crazy. So, so I dared to ask Neville Davis, do you think he may be Asperger's yeah, so he hog or ties autistic? Him means of so he hog ties him to prove to me that he's not because he should be screaming his lungs out by now if he's autistic. Yeah. Because a normal autistic kid would be screaming their lungs out by now and he thinks that this is a big joke and a big game. So we're in there in the dark and it was very intimate and it gave me an opportunity to talk about everything with him. It was a, it was a lovely experience actually and it's just one of the most privileged experiences of my life. Talking about all this deep and meaningful stuff and this is a child who I only knew as my friend's son. You know, like really? And the place was just crowded. It was packed full of cops and... Uh, dignitaries and councilmen and the mayor and um, priests from St. Stanislaus College and, and just the local churches. So I'm up there and Mark says, you're, you're up. So I come down here and everybody's watching me. These, these curtains were pulled back and at the back of the stage was a huge banner, the ritual banner, and it was huge, big silk satin banner. There was an altar a big altar erected in the middle here and I was made to lie down on the altar and Bruce Spence raped me on the altar. That was that part of the ritual. So I'm, what am I, 15, turning 16 at this time? And this was all happening during the time of the Bathurst City races, so the massive crowds here are disguised by the thousands and thousands of people and dignitaries and politicians that pour into Bathurst during the races. On stage are uh, Bruce Spence, who's a crap actor. He's been in Dimbula and Mad Max. There's Richie Benno, our Australian sporting legend who was captain of the Australian cricket team. He's dead now. There's John Avery, police commissioner, New South Wales police commissioner at the time, John Avery. There's uh, Kim Beasley Senior, and then there's, a, there's an obese red-headed woman who had red, long, oh well, about here, long red hair. You know, th there was a microphone here like this sort of thing and, and Beasley's, uh, sorry, Beasley's the main one, but it alternated between Benno and Beasley. But they had a real wry sort of manner about them and they spoke very, they had a similar demeanour and um, just mocking humanity. And they, so Beasley was up commentating, presiding over things. When they dragged onto stage, they dragged a heavily pregnant woman onto stage here and she was screaming her head off. And I remember sitting over there thinking, oh my God, she's not drugged, she's not hypnotised. And she's, this is, it was horrendous. So there's adrenaline going through her system and adrenaline going through, she's, her body and she's heavily, heavily pregnant and naked and she had a brown bowler cut haircut and she's one of the what they call a breeder and she's used just for breeding for these rituals and for, for child sex trafficking and um, 
they drag her onto the stage and they lay her down and the head for a sacrifice is always here. So they're laying and the feet's that end. Where she's screaming, right? Beasley's over here and he goes, he goes to us, I'll never forget this, he goes, she's screaming and making fuss and he goes, um, excuse us for a minute. And everyone laughs. Everyone thinks that's hilarious, except for me. And then they've got, because they had two big security guards dragging her onto stage and they needed extra help. So Bruce Spence, who is like usually the thug type who likes to hurt people, Bruce Spence and um, uh, John Avery, the, the cop, he used what he knows about holding people down and the four of them pin her down. And they're holding her legs and her, and her arms and whatever, shoulders. And then Benno has a ceremonial dagger. And he, um, he's like, it's further back. It's a shame this is here because he's further back. And he um, does his usual crap. You know, they, they, they worship their gods, you know, Baal. Lucifer, uh, Hail Satan, um, Son of the Morning, and, and all the other gods and goddesses, you know. And, uh, and then he has this knife and he slams it after he's done all his ritual, you know, ritualistic sort of chanting and words and whatever, and people are chanting or whatever. And he um, slams this dagger, ceremonial dagger, two hands, into the woman's, I don't know, oh, around about here where the, where the bone ends. And she can, he can get in and he, he tears her open with the knife right down to the pelvic bone. And blood just pisses out everywhere. It's like a you know, waterfall and just everything. And, um, and then they pull the baby out And, um, and then there are people assisting and they've got um, a gold platter and they've got um, a chalice and they collect the blood of the baby. They drain the baby's blood in the chalice and then they chop the baby up and put it on the gold platter and, uh, and then they pass it around for Holy Communion. So it's, it's the black mass, um, the real uh, typical old fashioned black, black mass that the Catholic mass is based on, right? The Catholic mass is a, the Latin mass is a sanitized version of this. There's nothing Christian about Catholic mass. So that's all going on. And then the next thing I remember is they lined up this stage was lined with children who must have been about maybe eight, nine, ten years of age, that sort of thing. And they had them lined up like this on the stage. They went like this and they lined the children up. And the children were hypnotised. And the children came forward and they were like this. They were just like this. They just, you know, as they were told, they did nothing and they just stared straight ahead. And they're very attractive children. Bruce Spence had a samurai sword. It was incredibly sharp. He goes along each, each child and he has a certain stance about him. Is it that way or is it that way? And he slices off the heads of each child I don't know if he turns or I can't remember what he does, but then he, you know, goes along and, you know, like this, and he goes along and chops off each head. And each kid falls, the body just falls, and blood is going everywhere. I mean, if you DNA tested this area, there would have to be remains of someone's blood and DNA in here. There would have to be somewhere. Then they break out into a bloodied orgy. Now, these people, the whole point behind doing the um, 
having the woman not drugged and not hypnotised is to pump as much adrenaline through her blood as possible because these people are addicted to, um, to adrenaline. And, um, and when they drink the blood, you know, it's, you know, the baby's blood, you know, the baby's in distress, so it passes on somehow to the kid. And uh, that's why they, you know, have this sort of situation going on. And at the end, I was over here and a bloody orgy broke out and everyone started having sex. They're sexually aroused by this stuff. You've got to understand that they are sexually aroused by this crap. I don't know, everyone's just having sex with people and, and Kim Beasley Senior was down here and I was there and he came down and he picked up a head of one of the kids that had dark hair and I'm, I'm standing here and uh, Beasley picks up this head and he shoves it in my face like this and there's this decapitated head in my face and he says, take me eat and he made me take a bite out of the face and um, then everyone just had an orgy it was just disgusting and uh, most vile vile thing you've ever seen in your life and that's Bathurst City Hall Three times I've had to flee, leave everything behind three times. One, okay, but three times. What I do have to offer is the, I, I, can, I can share what, how I got out. Yeah. That's all I've got. Deep down she wants to enjoy life, I think. But, you know, she finds it very hard. In no way did it change mum's personality, but how, how do I put it? it Grandma phrased it very well. How do... Where, so she could place blame where blame was due. It's so complex. If I want to put it in, apply it, you know, to behaviour. It's so complex because um, I always thought that I was rational and analytical, <laughs> you know, and that you could sort of make sense of things. Well, sometimes you can't. You know, it's outside, outside those boundaries. The Great Hall at Sydney University is where I witnessed the most heinous uh, human sacrifice of all time and the most difficult one to process and talk about in therapy and that is the flaying of a boy who was about five, a uh, little blonde boy, uh, Anthony Kidman and four other men were dressed in multicoloured robes according to the pentagram um, sort of symbol that um, I suppose captured uh, the inner Sydney diocese uh, that Kidman led his coven uh, and so there were multi multicoloured robes that I've drawn I was quite young I, I tried to stop the Ritual as soon as I realised what was going on and what they were about to do to this child. Uh, they crucified him and flayed his skin and, and pinned it back. And then they, they strung him up over. Once they'd done it, they, they did it to him alive. Once they'd finished that, they strung him up over the stage of the Great Hall. Um, Nicole Kidman was sitting down to the front uh, t to look at you know to the to the left as you look at the stage, I was sitting more to the back right, and I ran up and tried to, to stop them, and Bruce Spence put his big boot on my, put his foot on my neck to stop me, and he just laughed at me and everyone laughed at me, screaming and carrying on, trying to stop what they were doing and. Uh, yeah, quite a number of university staff are involved in uh, Sydney Uni chapter, I suppose, of, of the order, um, uh, which was run by Kidman. And Leonis Petruscus was a member of this uh, particular coven at one stage, and uh, he was at 
Sydney University around the same time as Anthony Kidman. So there's lots of prominent coven members who have gone through Sydney University. It's a very dark place and I would not allow my children to attend here, even on scholarship. I also remember being taken in, into the room on an upper floor of the of chemistry lecturer's room and uh, they did some something to me there and you could s it was overlooking the city um, and uh, and I was also taken into a sort of a medical basement area where I was subjected to some unethical practices and Hope Michelson was involved with that. She's someone I went to uni with later on at Bond University. When I was young I remember her clearly dressed in a white robe and assisting a dentist who had used to be, I think he formerly worked at Auschwitz. And it allowed me to sit there and be an observer to my own deprogramming process, which is phenomenal. You know, like that false military, he's a really military programmer and reprogrammer in Adelaide. Thompson. Yeah, that evil mongrel David Thompson. He, um, he couldn't believe it. He said, are you co-conscious? Are you co-conscious for all this when you're talking? Because I went through the process and I described everything as requested. I just answered the questions. He said, you co-conscious? I said, well, yeah, I've always been co-conscious. There's been no Sybil, oh, you know, an amnesia for what we just talked about. And that was my saving. I could ignore it and, you know, live for the moment, as you say, but I know I couldn't sleep at night. So this is uh, a very memorable church. I remember this. Um, I came here with Veronica. The place was packed. And, uh, and I witnessed a heck of a ceremony and Veronica was the Grand Dame and she was a, my mentor and I really liked her a lot. Red-headed lady. Um, she had something to do with, uh, I don't know, some sort of girls school or something like that. And I saw her ritually sacrificed here in front of all the dignitaries. The head being up this end on that image uh, is no accident. That's the way you face on an, on an altar when you ritually sacrifice someone. The head's always up this end. And it's called the left-handed path, so they always use the left hand and they start with the upper chest area. And when down. she was dying, I actually was so distraught, I collapsed up behind this side of the altar. And, um, Everybody thought, oh, that was great because it's a sign of affection and that we had a proper bond. I succeeded her as Grand Dame and, um, yeah, this is distressing. And of course, when I left, um, it left them with no one that they'd trained up in time um, to, you know, to succeed the Grand Dame position. Veronica actually died quite young and it was her choice. She had had a gutful and she wanted out and she didn't know how else to get out. Think of a song you can check out any time you like but you can never leave. She chose to check out. It's the only way out for her. And she's a really nice person. I think she was connected to St. Sophia College, but I can't remember well enough. I know she had some role to do with girls' school or a girls' dorm. At the end, I had to compose myself, despite the fact she was laying there dead, with blood everywhere. I had to compose myself, I had no choice. And they stuck some robe on me and something on my head, I don't know. But anyway, this is really, really, really upsetting. This is just another ritual site. That's all. <laughs> so this is Anglican and you've got another eagle. It's just another heavy occult symbol. That was about 11. Around the time that um, Queen Elizabeth came to declare Bankstown a city. I, 
I just remember children connected with like a silver cord or, or got silver cord and, the, and around their necks and a, a row of children. That's all I remember. I don't remember anything else. Rose. The rose is very um, important to Church of England covens. Serpent entwined around a pole. I mean, once again, what the hell's an eagle got to do with the Bible? Nothing. This is 16 uh, William Edward Street, Longville, in sort of North Sydney. Uh, this is Anthony Kidman's old house. I uh, was brought here when I was 14. I was dropped off by Leonis Petriscus. Uh, it was my birthday. Um, and there was, well, I think it was around my birthday. I think it was. And there was a post-production party um, for John Bell's play. And this house was the back room overlooking the pool was full of actors and you know producers directors you know whatever and uh theater people uh john bell bruce spence was here i i'm pretty sure bruce spence answered the door um i remembered the house was two story at the back and kind of one story at the front i remembered it was federation style uh, and I remember the back room and I remember the pool. I, I saw people taking what I think was cocaine um, in the back room near the pool in the lounge area. Um, people were kind of in costume. There was all different, I don't know if it was a fancy dress party. I really can't remember um, exactly what everyone was wearing, but I know there was a lot of famous actors there. Um, I... Um, Um, after everybody had gone home, I was left alone with uh, John Bell and Anthony Kidman. And I remember being in the back lounge room that opens up onto the, the pool area. And uh, I, was, I was assaulted in the lounge room area by Kidman and Bell. And I watched them engage in homosexual sex there. Then I was taken out into the pool and I was th thrown in the pool naked and Kidman got in the pool as well and he held my, we were at the far end of the pool in line with the back gate and um, I was facing out of the pool, I was facing John Bell who um, was being acting like an idiot, like doing a monkey dance and he had a mask on his face and he was naked and I was being held um, very painfully. Uh, Anthony Kidman was in the pool, locking my um, elbows together and pulling my shoulders back. So it was like a type of jujitsu type hold. You know, something it would be something you learn in martial arts. Um, and it was very painful. And um, while he did this, John Bell would be dancing like a monkey and every now and then and be chanting some like a some sort of song and then every now and then he just stomped on my head as he said certain words in the like a like a poem like a rhyme and he'd stomp on my head and hold me under like force me under and I nearly drowned and you know then I'd come up again I'd be coughing spluttering and crying and vomiting water and and then It'll happen again and again. It happened over and over. And uh, I don't remember what happened after that, except I woke up the next day um, tied to a chair in what looked like a basement. Um, I, it was very cold and cement-like. And um, I remember light filtering down through a like a doorway, but it was, it was like a ladder or a very steep stairway. Um, to upstairs and um, I was seated in a chair naked tied to a chair and Kidman was smacking me over the head really hard um, he was, so he was physically assaulting me and he was screaming at me do you remember now do you remember now 
And meanwhile, Nicole Kidman, his daughter, uh, had her arms crossed and she was leaning against a wall and sneering at me in contempt, with contempt. Uh, she didn't like me at all. She never liked me. Uh, I associated with her quite a bit um, throughout our childhoods and she always treated me terribly. Uh, Mrs Kidman um, washed and dried my clothes and um, I was dressed and um, Dr Mark came and picked me up. I didn't know that about the clothes, Mrs Kidman. Did you just remember that then? No. Oh. What I believe has been coming out in the Royal Commission against child abuse is proving that these is not this is not isolated. Fiona's might be unique in her story, but across the board, it's not isolated. In fact, it's um, more prevalent than not. So he uh, abuses a child. Want to tell us about that? <laughs> in seven yeah, years. Yeah, shit. <laughs>